Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Eric Lefevre. My contact information is right there on the whiteboard. So let me see if I can do this. Interactive and that guy. There we go. So for those that are overseas and you want to contact me, this is the best way to get hold of me. Um, this is the Security Plus class. The books that you guys have are yours. So uh, it will follow along with the slideshow that I have. So uh, you can make your copious notes in there. There will times when I get off book and I'll get up and actually work on the whiteboard a little bit to explain things, hopefully a little bit more in depth for you. Um, class is Monday through Friday, but we're gonna be testing on Friday. So I'm gonna teach this whole class at whole book in four days which I've done on multiple occasions. So we should be able to get through it without a problem. We'll actually finish up Thursday probably around 3.30 in the afternoon. So uh, class begins at 8.30 in the morning, goes till 7.30 in the evening. Is that correct? Matt's turning around Bye. going, say what? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't check with me on this one. <laughs> no, we go until 4.30 in the afternoon or until we're done for the day. Uh, we'll break at about 11.30 for lunch. We'll be back at 12.30. We'll take a mid-morning break. We'll take an afternoon break. Um, I'm staying locally right here in town, so if you have any questions or something, you want to email me or you need further explanation, you can always email me and I can always take care of that for you. So, um, not like there's a whole lot going on in town here in the evenings, right? You just have casinos here and great restaurants and those funny little crab things and you know Annapolis has good music going on and by the way tomorrow is Mardi Gras so I hope you're wearing your beads and your costumes and the whole nine yards tomorrow. Anybody here from New Orleans? No. Nobody from New Orleans? <laughs> Anybody been down to Mardi Gras? Excellent. What'd you think of Mardi Gras? It's a good party. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Actually the best time to go down there is the week before. So you go down a week before you get the parties, the parades and the great food and then get out of there before it gets too crazy. So, um, are there any questions about time of day, starting, any of that stuff? Okay, I'm gonna have you guys introduce yourselves. Tell me a little bit of back, about your background uh, in IT, and most importantly for me is your objective in the class and why you are here. So why don't we start right here? Uh, I see one more not a whole lot of background in IT, but, Technician gets involved in a lot of stuff in the maintenance world. Uh, been in about nine years, and uh, I'm heading back out to the fleet soon. Going to get this class to see uh, if I can contribute any of this knowledge on the ship. Excellent. You know what ship you're going on? New Orleans, actually. The Nolan. <laughs> okay, we got to teach you something here, Stephen. When you pronounce it, it's one word. It's not. Yeah. It's Nolans. Nolans. There you go. Yeah, Nola. You could say Nola too. Yeah, Nola. In the back corner over here. Yes. Sir. Yes. <laughs> Senior all stock. Uh, been in uh, a little over 19 years, 19 and a half. Uh, I have a degree in computer electronics in my rate. I really don't use it. Glad to be here. Excellent. We're happy to have you. Uh, Do you have a smartphone? Yeah. Then you have lots of experience with IT. <laughs> but not with computers and not with understanding how it all works together, correct? I have a little understanding. Okay, hopefully we'll change that. Excellent. Uh, I do three times a and then in two years, uh, IT experience is pretty minimal. We'll see how things go. 
Excellent. Um, sorry, Fila, I work across the street. I teach video. Um, this class was a favor for me. So uh, I'm getting a computer science degree. So it's where, where are you getting that? Uh, right now I'm taking it at UMBC. Good school. Decent. You should go after cybersecurity. Okay. That's where, that's where all the money is going to be. So when you start thinking about the, the steps of where you want to go to, cybersecurity is always in the background. They're always looking for somebody to do more in the realm of cybersecurity. And when you get out of the military, that's what's going to pay you the most money. My yep. I should do Bailey. I've uh, been in almost, almost nine years. Uh, as far as IT, I played on the computer side as a little kid. I mean, can't get no better than that. Games are the best place to start. <laughs> Absolutely. My dad would sit there and he'd, he'd go, what are you doing playing games? Dad, this is how you learn. He's like, I, no, 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 no. Who would play games on a computer? And then I brought home a Macintosh that had a casino game on it. I could, my dad is sitting there playing blackjack and I can't get him off the computer to come to Thanksgiving dinner. He's like, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost there. I almost, I almost made my million dollars. I'm like, what? So as we spoke earlier, if you are the last person in class for the day, you have to bring breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> You're not supposed to say okay. You're supposed to argue. I wasn't told this. I told you Air Force was coming in the front row, didn't I? I didn't know that, but yeah. Um, I see one with the Esposito. Um, I've been in just about seven, and uh, I have a little bit of experience with IT. Not not a lot. Just some of um, our equipment uses uh, the IT world, but I'm going to be going into networking at my next job. Excellent. I don't really know very much about what I'm going to be doing, but I was told networking. Networking is fun. program for many years in DBAs 3, 3 plus, and 4, and I got to the point where I'd been programming long enough that I didn't see any new routines of how to do things, and I just got bored with it, so I moved on. Let's build a computer system after that, so that's the pathway I took. Right behind you there in the center. Thank you, too, Rodriguez. I've been in for about eight years. i got minimal IT experience. Anymore. Excellent. Just to your left. I can see Grant. Been in seven years this month. Uh, quite a bit of IT experience. Uh, being at ISSO over here, Bachelor of Cybersecurity and Networking. Uh, programming Python. Uh, uh oh, Python. You're a hacker. No, no, I do it for server side. I build a website. Okay. Yeah. They keep my eye on you. And this is the CEU for uh, my certificate. So on our certificates at the end, it always says this is a 40-hour course. So we made sure that that was put on those certificates just to make sure you, okay. you got it right there. You can go back to them and go, hey, I got this. Right behind you there. Uh, Jimmy Steigman, Defense Media Activity. Work uh, in the maintenance side for transmissions. Basically everything on the broadcast side is starting to go towards IT, so I'm just trying to get ahead of it and get a better knowledge of it. Excellent. In the back, in the corner. Well, um, <coughs> fun up. Um, been in the Navy for 18 years and change right now. Um, I'm a legacy technician like most everybody else here, um, but along with broadcast equipment, most of our systems are moving up to our computer-based and IT systems also. Uh, so we're here. Excellent. So we've got a hacker and somebody that plays with Python. <clears throat> I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm just so glad it's not my machine that's up here. <clears throat> oh, 
All right, in the back. Oh, uh, good morning. I'm uh, IC1 Gorham. Um, I went through this class last week, so I'm kind of like an expert now. <laughs> Not really. Uh, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, also, very little IT before this. I've uh, been in about eight and a half years, uh, but ready to learn, and you know, hopefully round two will teach me the stuff that I didn't pick up on round one. Oh, no, no. If you yeah. got the last week, you have to be up here this oh, yeah, week. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going in the back. You're coming up front. Uh, maybe next week. <laughs> Uh, we do have donuts on the far side, and you guys may not have seen it. Help yourself. Um, any feedback you have about the class, uh, please let me know. Uh, this is kind of new for us to do it this kind of way. Uh, we have some guys BTC and around the world. Uh, any feedback you have, feel free to grab me offline, and uh, we'll apply it to future classes. I think this is the first class went really well, and I think this one's going to go just as good. I'm going to go ahead and pass around the sign-up sheet. If your name is not on the sign-up sheet, please add it in a format that's readable. If you need a little bit more space, go ahead and take as much space as you need to put your name in so that they can read it back at my office. Uh, sign your name. Please place your initials under day one. You're going to put your initials past all the different days. Please do not put a check mark because that's not initials. So your command wants to see your initials. And if we've misspelled your name, please cross it out. If you need room down at the bottom to spell it correctly, go ahead and do that. I know about misspelling my name. My name has been misspelled so many times, mispronounced the whole nine yards. There are times when people call me Mr. Le, some call me Dr. Johnny Fever, uh, but the last name is Le Fever. You can just call me Eric, that's fine. Or just, hey, Eric, what's going on with this? So my background is I've been teaching for, oh, it looks like seven minutes. Never done this before. No, just kidding. I started teaching computer classes in 1990. So I was teaching, I got my master's in business administration, so uh, I was teaching a lot of junior, at a lot of different junior colleges. So the introduction to computer classes. Uh, I've been a field service engineer for most of my life. So I built computer systems, I built networks. Uh, I've been the IT director at Silicon Valley College where we taught the A+, plus, Net+, plus, Security+, plus classes. My Cisco instructor turned out to be a no-show, so I took over and taught the Cisco classes. What I love about Cisco is you get to build a network and then you get to program the routers, the switches, the firewalls, the access points. So I've taught the firewall classes, I've taught the uh, wireless access point classes. Um, I teach the ethical hacking, I teach the forensics class. I do the CISSP class. I also do the SISM class. So I've maintained my captain's license with the U.S. Coast Guard for the last 40 years. In case this teaching thing doesn't work out, I can fall back and go back to running dive boats and talking to tourists. So I ran boats in Hawaii for five years and San Diego for seven years, which makes me about 95 years old by the time you look at all my experience. This is actually my 17th career, so I'm still trying to figure out if this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I'm 64 years old, and I'm supposed to retire next year. Not going to happen. Why? Because I have way, way, way too much fun doing this. I get the opportunity to travel all over the world and teach for the military. So they've sent me everywhere from the Middle East to Europe and Asia uh, to Hawaii. They keep having to send me back to Hawaii. I don't get this. Who wants to go to Hawaii? I mean, is nice weather, palm trees. You want to go in my place? Keep studying, and I might have to send you in my place. No, I always love going over there because having lived there for five years running boats over there, I still remember uh, a lot of people and still know a lot of people over there, so I go diving with them whenever I can over there. So um, first, let me say thank you all for your service and your sacrifice that you make. You've got my email here, elfcisco at earthlink.net or at Gmail or at Yahoo. Any one of those will work. Um, if you're getting ready to take any exams, feel free to email me. Because if I have any resources at all that I can use to help you out in gaining your certification, I will do that. I will share it with you. So my goal is your certification. My goal is to make sure at the end of this week you are ready to test out. So on Friday, if you want to test, you are welcome to. If you feel you need a little bit more study time, we can do that as well. So uh, I do have a, we do have some systems that you guys are welcome to take home with you. So Phoenix TS, 
uh, has brought those in. So I have some additional study materials that are on this that we can put on that for you. Um, you can transfer those off to your home system. Uh, if you've got a Macintosh, it doesn't work well on a Mac unless you have the Windows that you can run on top of your Macintosh. So again, the more time you can spend going through the questions and studying the questions that we have, because we do have what's called a VCE player that's up on our computers, and it's, we've got a file that's on your desktop. If you go through those questions, there's about 300 and something questions, 328. If you go through all those questions twice, and you go through some of the hands-on, there aren't many questions that they can ask that you haven't seen something very similar to that. So the last two classes that I have taught, every one of my students passed their security class. So I want to keep that record going. I have a bet with Sandy, who's the salesperson up at Phoenix TS. I don't want to lose the bet. So again, if you feel comfortable and ready to take the test on Friday, I don't want you to feel pressured in it, but they have, Matthew, they have until two weeks from, yeah. that, from Friday? Yeah, two weeks. And then, uh, and then as you test, uh, please you know, send all your results on to me for tracking purposes if I have knock that out, okay? Okay, does anybody have any questions? Anybody got any answers? We want to start the class earlier in the morning. No, we can't do that because we got people coming in from overseas. Let's talk about what we're going to cover in this course. In this course, we're going to go ahead and make sure that you can correctly use the fundamental security technology. The, we want to be able to conduct a risk assessment. Did anybody run into any risk driving in this morning? You're smiling right here. Why? Uh, Maryland drivers. Maryland drivers. Don't look at me. I'm not a Maryland driver. I'm a California <laughs> driver. We're aggressive. So get out of my way. Um, what's your biggest concern on the road besides the drivers? Um, potholes. Oh, potholes. there are a lot of potholes. Yes, there are. But yeah, there's some crazy drivers out there. I love the guy who was in the far left lane on the freeway last night who decided that, oh, that's my exit, right in front of four cars. I'm like, are you nuts? There's a little snow out here. It's icy and you're pulling this one off. The best one, I flew back into California. Friday night and then back out here on Saturday, I had to go sign some contracts. And it was raining really hard. And an individual sitting next to me is weaving into my road, into my lane. And you know, we're only doing 45 on the freeway because it's raining so hard. And they kept coming in, so I came up alongside and they were on their phone. Because apparently being on your phone is more important than watching the road. So it's like, are you nuts? This is crazy. You are on a freeway and it's raining so hard we can barely see out of this. And you're on your cell phone. Did, you look at them? Did I what? Did you call? Among other things, yes. Okay. <laughs> you have to let these people know. I waved many times. Hey, never the face never came up from the phone. No matter how often I honked, they just kept looking down like. I like time to exit over to the far right hand side and let them stay in the far left lane and I'll just go really slow and wait till I watch them spin out. Between that and my mom's house there were four accidents on the other side of the freeway where they had put in the, the uh, CHP brakes to where they wouldn't let traffic go through until they came in and cleared out all the action. So yeah, it was one of those bad days in California. We want to take a look at recognizing some of the common attacks out there. There's a lot of different ways that we can attack your system, including social engineering. It's probably the easiest one, uh, malware, network attacks, and application attacks. They talk about social engineering being one of the easiest attacks that's out there. There was a study that was done where they took USBs and they put the company logo on the USB and they placed the USB in the break room of 100 different companies. What percentage of those USBs made their way into the corporate network? Only 85%. What they did, however, was a second little test where they ended up taking a DVD, stamped the company logo on it, and then wrote with a Sharpie, corporate underscore payroll underscore 2019 dot XLS. What percentage of those made their way into the corporate network? 100%, why? 
They're leveraging your curiosity to say, hey, 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 I gotta find out where I sit in the pecking. I gotta find out what that CEO's making. So where do I sit in the pecking order? That becomes real important to a lot of people. That file wasn't even there. The moment they put the disk in and the disk booted up, they had that backdoor access into the computer. So that's one of the things that we always take a look at. We want to make sure that we can identify the fundamental network components, the technologies, understand network addresses, recognize some common network ports and applications. We also want to be able to identify common network security components and secure transport protocols. So when you think about connecting out to your bank, do you connect into HTTP or HTTPS? S, why? It's adding in that SSL or secure socket layer, also now, no, now known as transport layer security, to add that level of security that we have going between you and your bank, because you want to make sure that that is secure. We want to make sure that we harden the networks and apply the monitoring and detection techniques. Thank you, sir. We want to explain some common cryptographic techniques and standards, identify the public key infrastructure concepts, and apply some transport encryption to these. We're also going to take a look at applying security controls to our data, to our hosts, and to our mobile devices. How many of you do banking on your mobile phone? How many of you feel that that's secure? I got one kind of, sort of, and a couple of, well, kind of, maybe. So do I if I've got access to your phone. How easy is it? What kind of phone do you have? Um, an Apple. Oh, it's going to be so much harder for me to clone your phone. If you've got an Apple iPhone, it's very difficult for us to clone your phone. If it happens to be one of the others, the Android version, much easier for us to clone your phone. So when you start thinking about your phone, always be cautious because that's the new attack. Everybody wants to attack your phone. They don't want to attack your computer because most people spend most of their time on their phone and they do everything from their phone. So if I can clone your phone and you've got your banking connection to that, all I have to do is then find your, capture your username and password. Unless you're smart enough to keep it stored on your phone, then I'll have it as well. So please make sure you put it on your phone so when I clone it, no, I would never do that. We want to make sure that we plan for secure web applications and our virtual services. So we'll take a look at the ways that we can secure your web pages and also take a look at our virtual boxes that we've got out there. We want to explain some authentication factors and understand the network authentication protocols. So we're going to take a look at the different ways that we can authenticate with the different types of networks that we have. We want to make sure that we can recognize the access control models that are out there, apply some file level access control, and centrally manage the account security. So that's one of the chapters that we've got as well. We want to apply some operational security techniques through the organizational policies, the user training, and physical security controls. When we think about the different policies that we have, we have things like security policies. We have procedures. We have standards. We have guidelines. And these are the things that we're going to take a look at, who writes them and who's putting them out there. How many of you are getting out of the military soon? Anybody? Nobody? Really? How many of you are getting out within the next 10 years? When you get out in 10 years, would you like to start making maybe 250 to 300,000 a year? Would you like to do most of your work from home? No, really? I don't like indoors. You don't like indoors? Well, one of the things that a lot of companies do not like to do is they don't like to write their own policies. They don't like to write their own procedures. And the thing they really hate writing is things like the Business Continuity Plan Disaster Recovery Plan. So you can go out to places like SANS.org. You can get some great templates from them, and then you can start writing these things for companies. How much can you charge a company to write their policies for them? About 150 an hour, which is around 300,000 a year. While you're there, Ashley, can you then do a ethical hack of their system just to see where their vulnerabilities are? How much can you charge for the ethical hack? About 200 an hour? So far, we're, uh, we're up to around 350,000 a year. Is that enough? OK, just want to make sure that we're taking care of you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> So it's something to think about, and after you've done this for about a dozen or two companies, 
you'll get to a point where all you're going to be doing is that annual renewal of that. And then, actually, how often should we be doing a vulnerability scan of somebody's computer system? Once a year, twice a year, once a quarter, once a month? If I can break into your house and I can get into your computer, can I then find your passwords? Yes. Very. Do you notice that most people at home use that same username and password somewhere else, yes. like their bank? Yes. So if I can capture your one username and password, we can pretty much use that anywhere, because you are going to use that those credentials somewhere else. What would be another reason that I want to get into your home computer system? What else do you have that I want? <laughs> Don't need it. Um, Anybody? Why would I want to break into your home computer system? What do you have that I want? Your banking information. I want your bank account information. I want your credit card information. This is where a lot of people are going right now is we want to capture your credentials and your banking information and some of your PII. What is PII? Personal identifiable information. So something like your social security number. Why would I want that? Because I can become you. How many of you were affected by OPM's little breach of security? We all were. Myself included. So right after that happened, one of the things I do, I'm an independent contractor. So when I file my taxes, I always get that six-month extension because I had a student years and years and years ago who was working for the IRS, and he told me if you get the extension, there is less of a chance of being audited. Okay, then. I like this. So I always got the extension, and after I filed my extension, I went ahead and filed my taxes on... October 15th, like I'm supposed to, I get a letter the first portion of November from the IRS. Would you please call us? Why do I need to call the IRS? So I called him up and I told him who I was and the gentleman at the other end says, well, we need to verify and validate that you are who you say you are. I said, okay, what do you need? He said, before you bought your house in Tennessee, you used to live in California. What was the city? I said, Costa Mesa. He said, what was the street address? I don't remember 10 years. Do you remember where you lived 10 years ago? I said, look, it was Eldon Avenue, 2600, I think, 2690, 296. I can't remember. He goes, good enough. That works for me. He said, when you bought your house in Tennessee, who handled your mortgage? I said countrywide, but they went out of business. And he said, who bought your, your note? I said, Bank of America. Account starts with 127. He goes, good enough. I just want to make sure it's you. I said, why? He said, well, there's a new scam going on where people will file taxes on your behalf. Not only do they file your taxes, they go ahead and submit your W-2, telling you, oh, by the way, last year you made $285,000. And you paid $86,000 in taxes. After they submit that, then they're going to go ahead and file online your tax return for you. By the way, did you know that you moved? You didn't know that you moved, did you? But guess what? When they make that filing for you, they're going to redirect your payment to a different location. So I asked this gentleman that worked at the IRS, why is this happening? He said there was uh, somebody who got caught couple years ago, who was doing this, he'd go out and spend $1,000 and buy 100 usernames and social security numbers. And he would file taxes on behalf of those 100 people. What percentage of those 100 people did the IRS pay out on? 40%. What was the average amount of money that was paid for each one of those? $4,000. How much money is that? 
40 times 4,000 is how much? $160,000. You're a young buck, you're 21 years old, you now have $160,000 in cash. Michael, what are you gonna buy with that? What did he buy with that? How's that? <laughs> what color car? Red. What kind of car? Uh, he yeah. bought a Ferrari. Ferrari. And he spent the rest of the money partying. Oh, he's out dancing every night. He's got the clubs. He's spending money. He's buying uh, Cristal and enjoying it with the young ladies. And get That's the best thing he can do. If it's all going to go away, he might as well spend it. When he, when he realizes he's down to his last $1,000, what's he do? do again. Yes! <laughs> when they caught him, how many cars did he have in his garage? Well, Seven. <laughs> how much money did he have in the bank? Three million dollars. Well, you can only buy so many cars, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> who does he now work for? Uh, IRS. IRS. And who's the other entity? FBI. The FBI. So he said, my account got flagged by this individual. I said, say what? <laughs> He goes, he noticed that this is more money that you norm than you normally ask for in a return. So we wanted to flag that just to make sure that you are who you say you are. So when things come across his desk, he looks at it and he says, this is just a normal return. This is highly questionable, which is where mine was. And this is really questionable. This is the one that we're going to go do a full audit and a full review on before we send out any money. So he said, mine was in the pile that required a phone call from me to find out that I was who I said I was. And it was all predicated on the OPM breach because my social security number was one of those that had gotten breached. So when we start taking a look at some of the things that we are looking at, we are looking at the fact that on the security side of things, we want to make sure that you are secure at home, make sure that you're secure at work, make sure that the data you're sending across the wire is secure. That's really what we're looking at for this week. We're going to take a look at disasters. We're going to take a look at planning for disasters through business continuity plans. To me, a business continuity plan, disaster recovery plan is one plan. When you think about a business continuity, it's a disruption to your company. Anybody heard of the hurricane that came through called Harvey? Where did Harvey hit? Houston. How long did Harvey sit there right off the Houston coast and pick up more and more rain or water from the Caribbean or from the uh, Gulf of Mexico and then kept dumping it on Houston for about a week. So there was a company there and just imagine you're the company there all of a sudden you've had this disruption of all this rain. Does that disruption finally get to a point where it's moved from disruption to disaster? Is there some sort of trigger mechanism that says now we're in a disaster? This is why I put disaster recovery at the end of my business continuity plan because a business continuity or disruption to my company may lead to a disaster. So this one company that was down there had covered their assets quite well. They had a secondary location. Where was their secondary location? It was over in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The problem was Harvey lifted up from Houston and went where? Lake Charles, Louisiana. How does that happen? How does it decide I'm going to go get this company's other place of business? That's what happened. And it brought down the entire business. Now, you're going to hear some opinions from me about the cloud. I don't like the cloud. I don't t like taking my data and relinquishing the control of my data to someone else in the cloud. But this would have been one of those cases where if they had encrypted their data and put it up on the cloud, even though their secondary location got hit and brought down, they at least would have had their data. And that's what we always look at, is how do we keep ourselves up and running at all times? And that's the most important part about any business, is how do we always make sure that we are up and running for our customers and for our employees? So in this first chapter, again, you guys can follow along with the book. In the first chapter, we're going to talk about some basic security concepts. We're going to talk about how to calculate and manage risks. We're going to take a look at how to find the vulnerabilities in your system. 
So this first module talks about the CIAAA triangle. I'm going to add a couple A's to this. We're going to talk about how to distinguish the risks, the threats, and the vulnerabilities. We're going to take a look at some of the security controls we can put into place, and then how to distinguish events and incidents. So this first thing that we're going to take a look at is the CIA triangle. Whenever we take a look at the CIA triangle, there are, of course, the three parts of confidentiality. With confidentiality, what we're looking at is encrypting our data. We want to make sure that people can't see our data. So if the data is sitting on my computer system, I'm going to encrypt my hard drive. If my data is going across the wire, I want to make sure that I'm encrypting the data going across the wire. Unfortunately, when we're using the data, we have to decrypt it to be able to use it. But the confidentiality side talks about encryption. Integrity. We have some algorithms out there that are called hashing algorithms. We use this to make sure that your data hasn't been altered from the time it's left your network to the time they received it. So what I'll do is I'll take the data, run it through the hashing algorithm. I will send you the data plus the hash. When you get the data plus the hash, you'll split it apart. You'll take the data, run it through the hashing algorithm. You'll compare the two hashes. The hashes match. We're good to go. Anybody here ever download an update from the internet for your operating system? Anything like patches or hot fixes? When you're doing that, does Microsoft or Linux or Unix give you the hash that goes with this? Why would they do that? You can verify that nobody has tampered with it. If I went to a place instead of Microsoft, like CNET.com, would I be concerned that somebody might have added something to it, such as a Trojan horse? And they won't give me the hash. So I never know if this has been altered or not. So that's one of the things that we look at with the hashing algorithm or the integrity side of it. This last portion that we talked about with the A is availability. We want to make sure that this is this data is available to you when you need it. So how do we make sure it's available to you? What do we do? Well, one of the things I do is I back up my data. I just use a USB or I'll use an external hard drive. And it's an easy way of, of me being able to back up what I've got. So in case something were to happen, I just refer back to my backup and we are good to go. So we always think of doing the backup do we ever test the backup? Anybody heard of a company called Kaiser Permanente Hospital? When I was a field service engineer, I went to all 47 Kaiser facilities in Northern California. I was outsourced to them. So I was the traveling technician going around. So I get a phone call. One of the facilities they have is down in San Jose. It's called Santa Teresa. So I get a call to go down there and restore their network. So I get down there and the hard drive has crashed on their server. So it's not usable. You can hear the actuator going back and forth so it actually broke so you can't, it can't the read write heads can't move. So the actuator actually moves the read write heads. So it doesn't work. So I gotta put a new hard drive in there. So I put the new hard drive in, I put the DOS operating system, I go ahead and put the uh, netware operating system. After that I go ahead and put in the tape backup software. After I put in the tape backup software, I drop my tape in there, and to my surprise, there's a catalog that says they have been backing this up religiously for the last 10 years. I want this is great, so I go to restore it. What have they been backing up for the last 10 years? Only the operating system. Not once did they ever back up any data. Excuse me, what? I'm looking at this going, for 10 years, really? You've been backing up only the operating system. Never once did you look to see if you were backing up the data. And they went, oops. So what did they have to do? What was the only choice they could do? Take that old hard drive and send it in and have them rebuild the hard drive. $6,000 and two weeks later, they got their drive back and they went, oh, well, most of the data is no longer valid anyway. What? Yeah, it was basically this was the computer that handled locations of every doctor, nurse, and patient in 14 other hospitals. So you would call their main number and you'd say, oh, my uncle's staying up in 
this location and they'd go, what's the last name? They'd look it up and go, let me ring his room. And that was the information. So that changes a lot on a daily basis. Also where the doctors are located and the nurses are located. So I thought it was rather interesting that they would spend that much money to have that thing rebuilt, even though it really didn't have up-to-date information on it. The other two A's I want to talk about, one is uh, authentication. How do we know that you are who you say you are? When I walked into the airport the other day, how did they verify and validate that I was who I say I am? What's that? Be a little bit more specific, if you would, please. What kind of ID? Because if I walked in with an ID that I produced myself, they're just going to look at me and laugh, which they've done. So a government issued, anything else? Photo ID. So a government issued photo ID. I remember when I was in Nashville, I had a guy in front of me who had a Vermont driver's license. It's made of paper, there's no picture, and it's been laminated. It's a valid driver's license. This was three years ago. So he hands his license to the guy from TSA. Guy looks at the license and he goes, I'm sorry, but you need a photo ID from the state of Vermont. Of course, being the loudmouth that I am, I'm standing behind him. And I went, Mr. TSA agent, <clears throat> if you take a look at that little binder behind your desk, there on the third shelf down, you will notice under V for Vermont that that's a valid driver's license. And he looks at me and it goes, I will get to you in a moment. So shut up and sit back. I'm like, whoa. So he pulls his little book out. He looks at it and goes, sir, you are good to go. Come on in. So he reaches behind and he pulls out his glove and he looks at me and he snaps the glove and he looks at me and he goes like this and he goes, yo mine now, boy, let's go. <laughs> and he says, don't mess with me. And I went, I'm, I apologize, I shouldn't have said anything. And he goes, I would have gotten there. He goes, I'm just messing with you. But it was funny because, you know, when they, they had those machines that you put your hands up and they circle around you. So I did that when I was at the uh, airport. So as soon as I get done, the guy looks at me and goes, would you please stand here? And he's putting his glove on. He's like, you are following me. Let's go. I'm like, no. These guys at the TSA have a sense of humor. He's going, nah, I'm just messing with you. He goes, I need my gloves anyway because I'm going to be opening up your bag to look inside because they just alerted me that there's something in there. I had left a burrito in there. They looked at my burrito and they went, we got to run this through. So they, they take their little thing out and they swab it. And they get this little peak thing coming out, kind of like the peak up there. And they went, I'm sorry, would you please step into this little room over here and take your clothes off? And I'm like, you're serious? And they went, yeah. You have gun residue, gunshot residue on your burrito. What? My buddy who owns the Mexican restaurant in... Orange County, California, I was visiting my mom, and on my way out, I called him up and said, can you make me some taquitos with the uh, guacamole and the uh, cotija cheese on there, and I'll take a carne asada burrito. So I ate uh, taquitos on my way to the airport, and I had a carne asada burrito for my lunch. And apparently, he and his son went shooting that morning. He's a southpaw, so he shoots with his left hand, and the gun residue was on his hand. So when he grabbed the paper sleeve to drop the burrito in, the sleeve is what had the gun residue on it. When they realized that was the only thing in my whole bag that had gun residue, they went, you're good to go. I said, do I get to take the burrito? And they went, eh, yeah, OK. I, was, I would have been pissed had they taken my burrito. <laughs> the last day I want to talk about is something called the anti-replay. A replay attack would be, I'm going to watch you log on to your system. I'm going to capture that. Because in the ethical hacking class, we teach you how to capture that information. As you begin to log off, I'm going to log back in as you. I'm hoping that you've used your American Express credit card. Why the American Express? Because there's no limit on most of them, which means I can go buy that red Ferrari that I want, or that little beach shanty that I want that's you know, down in Mexico somewhere. So when you think about the anti-replay, Microsoft, Cisco, Juniper, all of these companies now say if you're going to replay that, we're going to stop and ask you, would you please type in the password once again? So we're trying to prevent that from occurring. We take a look at this whole thing in a collective form. We are looking at something called non-repudiation. What is non-repudiation? You can't deny sending that message. If you remember, there was a senator from the state of New York named Anthony Weiner. 
Apparently he had sent some pictures of himself because he's a, he was at that time a congressman. Um, the FBI got involved and they asked, did you send out the tweet right before this? And he said, yes. Did you send out the tweet after this? To which he said, yes. And they went, well, between these two tweets, it was three and a half minutes. There's no way you were unconscious for that time frame. So we have to assume you sent the photos out of yourself. So he went, oops, yeah, you caught me. So that's when he stepped down and apparently got caught again doing that when he was running for, what was it, mayor of New York City? But yeah, oops. Okay, let's take a look at some of the definitions that we have out here. The risk, the chance of harm coming to an asset. We're thinking about driving into work. There is a risk because there is a chance that someone who is a very bad driver could end up coming across their lane and hitting us. A threat would be anything that can cause harm to an asset. So we think about all the threats that are out there. And even if you're just walking down the street by yourself, there are some threats out there that are always of concern to us. Vulnerabilities, any weakness an asset has against a potential threat. When we think about our operating systems, is the operating system itself got some vulnerabilities? Is there a place I can go where I can find out what the vulnerabilities are in my operating system or the operating systems I have for any of the devices that I have in my office? Yes, it's called CIRT.org, C-I-R-T dot O-R-G, so CIRT.org. CERT.org is run by Carnegie Mellon University, the Software Engineering Institute. And you might have heard of the entity who is sponsoring all of this, called the DOD, pays for the bill for this thing. So if you wanted to find out about your operating system, so I've got a workstation up here. If I wanted to find out what the vulnerabilities of this workstation are, I could simply go in and take a look at the operating system. I could go out to CERT.org. CERT.org is going to say, type in your operating system. Tell us what version you're running. It's going to come back and say, here are the threats to your operating system. Has anybody heard of a company called Equifax? What happened to Equifax not too long ago? They got hacked. How did they get hacked? It's very simple. Somebody ran a scan on them to find out what their IP address scheme is. It's actually very easy. You can actually jump online. You can go to Aaron and Iona and you can find out from Equifax.com who owns it, who set it up, and what was the IP address range that was given to them. So then I can take some of the tools I have, run a scan on that, and find out what IP addresses are up and running. From that, I can use another tool called Netcraft. Netcraft is one of my favorite tools to use because Netcraft is going to tell me what your operating system is with a 97% or success rate. It's going to tell me what patches you have on your system. And most importantly, it's going to tell me when was the last time you rebooted this. Why is that important to us? What's that? Patches don't get updated until... So you reboot the system. So somebody looked at it and said, hey, they haven't put their patches in in two months. Let's go to cert.org, let's find out the vulnerability, and let's go ahead and launch this attack against them. So they got in very easily. I believe they used Metasploit as one of the tools that we also teach in the ethical hacking class. They used Metasploit to get into the web page, boom, and got in there and got, again, all of my information. Why do people want my information? and your information as well. So every time we turn around, somebody's going after our information. So what's the best thing you can do? What's that? I was gonna say move to a little tiny island in the South Pacific. I'm working on finding, which, finding out which one I wanna to move to right now. But yeah, you can actually dissolve yourself from the rest of society very quickly from doing something like that. So, um, with Equifax, there's no government control, no government oversight as to any of the credit reporting companies. I would like to see that changed. But we start thinking about our personal credit history and all our information about all the credit cards that we have, um, all the bank accounts that we have, all that information got out there about us. So you should always be a little concerned about your credit. So with that being said, you should go out to the top three credit companies and you should lock your credit with them.
which means that the only person that can unlock it is you. So that's a great way of being able to protect yourself. So there are lots of vulnerabilities and people know how to leverage that vulnerability to get in to your system. Some of the security standards organizations that we have out there, CIS is the Center for Internet Security. We've got the IEEE, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering, IETF, which is the International Engineering Task Force. The International Standards Organization is the ISO, or actually it's the International Organization for Standardization. We've got ISOC, which is the Internet Society, so they talk about what you can and cannot do up on the Internet. We've got the International Telecommunications Union. We've got NIST and the NSA. You've never heard of either one of those, I am sure. And then, of course, we've got the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. So when we take a look at the way that we describe how attacks occur, we have Bob and Alice who are going to be sending messages between them. And then we have Eve, who is the evil attacker, who will be trying to capture the information between Alice and Bob. This is a standard that's been used across the industry for years and years and years. So we will continue to do that as well this week. So many times in the ethical hacking, we play Eve, and we go in and we want to disrupt or we want to capture the data going across the wire. When we take a look at some of the different controls that we can put into place, one of the biggest ones right now is the administrative control. The administrative controls that we have are going to include things like our policies, our procedures, our standards, our guidelines. All of those become the administrative side of things. We also look at training. We want to make sure that our employees are getting the proper training to understand those policies and procedures that we have. We think about the technical side. We think about the fact that I want to put in routers and firewalls, passwords, and all these other things. When you guys go to log into your computer systems, it requires a two-part authentication. Yeah. What do you need to get onto a computer? You need your CAC and PIN your PIN. So that'll get you in. So we start looking at some of the solutions we put in there are the technical solutions that we've got. The operational, the day-to-day -day employee activities that we have. So you come into work, you log in, you start doing your work. You might notice that there's some unusual things going on with your system. So again, that operational is we want to hear from our employees. We want to find out if you think that something is wrong or not working properly. The physical side. I always love going to bases because there's three, I call them the three G's when I come in. The gates, the guards, and the guns. Is that a good way to protect yourself? Only if you know how to use them. I mean, I remember the very first time I went to Bahrain and I walked up to the front gate. And they've got the big sandbags. They've got some automatic weapons sitting there. And I'm looking at this going, who in their right mind would want to try to storm the front of this? So yeah, you look at that and you say, what are the physical ways that we can do this? As you're driving along 175, as you're coming around the base, you notice the fence. It's got that double, it's eight foot high. It's got that barbed wire up on top. Why would you want to try to go over that? I was down at one of your bases in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. One of my students asked if I could come out and take a look at the Cisco equipment that they have to see if it would work for the advanced classes. And he had mentioned that Obama had moved some of the inmates from Guantanamo Bay up to their facility, their brig that they have there. Going around the outside was a fence, and hanging on the fence was a sign that said, don't touch the fence. Why? No. It's got motion sensors on it, so if the fence is moving, they notice this. They also have a little notice that says, don't talk to the inmates. And I went, do you really have somebody that's going to go up and talk to the inmates? He goes, there was a guy here two weeks ago. Not only was he talking to the inmate, he was hanging on the fence to talk to the inmate. He said he doesn't have to worry about it now because he can talk to the inmates all he wants. Why? He's now an inmate himself. I mean, come on. Knock, knock. Can I come in? Thank you, I want to talk to these guys. I'll be there for a while. So you start thinking about the physical ways that we, we're going to take a look at, at defense in depth, and the physical is that first step in defense in depth. So you want to keep people from getting into your facility. The ways that we implement some of those controls that we looked at, preventative would be one of the things that we have. What's a good preventative control that we have out there? 
Gates guards and guns would do it, wouldn't it? So we started thinking about the guards because security guards are there to provide some discerning discretion on their part as to whether or not they stop you and talk to you. Could be detective, could be a way that we monitor or detect something. So again, it could be that somebody's on the fence and they're actually causing movement on the fence. Could be corrective, follow-up controls used to minimize the harm caused and prevent any reoccurrence. So corrective could be that I'm gonna go back in and I've lost this file or this folder, I'm gonna go ahead and go to that tape backup and go ahead and reinstall that. Could be a deterrent, could be that visible control designed to discourage the attack or the intrusion. In the old days, what did they have outside of the fort? They kept people from just walking into the fort. They had a moat. So unless you can swim across the moat, you're not. And what did you want to put in the moat to keep people from actually crossing the moat? Piranhas. Oh, piranhas or gators, I love that. Yeah, two great answers. So, you know, water moccasins down south would also work. So you're starting to look at that going, no, not good, not good at all. We start putting in some of the confidentiality controls that are out there, least privilege. We only want to grant you access to those things to do your job. So we don't want to grant you access to everything. Why? What happens when we give you access to everything? What's that? You can get curious. Ooh, let's find out what people are making as far as money. Absolutely. So as a field service engineer, one of my calls that I had to go make was out to a construction company. They actually called themselves a construction consortium. Four guys in high school each started their own construction company. And rather than saying, let's all go buy our own equipment that we need for construction, why don't we just buy it as a consortium? And then when you need something, you can go ahead and use it out of the consortium. They had their wives working there. So their wives handled everything. So the network's not working. So I show up to find out why. So I'm talking to Renee, who is the network administrator. And I said, so Renee, how do people log in? She said, um, can we take this outside? What? So we go outside of the building. I said, what's going on? She said, she explains to me how the company works, that all their husbands are the contractors and the wives come in. And she said, I work with three other ladies. Our husbands all own this place. So. She said, many of the ladies I work with don't even know what day of the week it is. So many times on Monday around 10.30 in the morning, I got to call them up and remind them the weekend's no longer here. It's now Monday. Got to come back into work. If they can't remember what day of the week it is, how are they going to remember username and password? So how did she log them in? What's that? They came in as administrator, but they didn't have to remember a username and password. Why? Nope. She actually wrote a script. So when they turned on their system, the script ran and then brought them in as administrator. So we come walking back in after she's explained this to me. She said, every one of us is an administrator because my, our guidelines for the consortium say that if one person in is, is an administrator, everyone has to have equal access. So we come walking back inside, and one of the ladies is crying in the corner. She said, it was me, it was me, I did this. What do you mean you did this? What did you do? She said, if you look on my desk, you will notice that I am somewhat OCD. Everything has a place and a place for everything. What branch of the military says that? Boat captains, you gotta watch for boat captains, because we are a unique group. We always say that your things have to be in the right place, why? If my engine just overheated and I need a certain wrench, it's got to be right where I need it because I'm going to need to go grab it right now to go fix that problem before we sink. So yeah, you got to have a place for everything. So she said, I'm looking at my desktop of my computer and there was an F drive up there. What is the F drive on my computer system? It's my file server. She said the F drive didn't belong to her because she doesn't have an F drive. She's got a C drive, which is her hard drive, and an A drive, which is her floppy. What's the F drive? Well, that doesn't belong to her. So what did she do with the thing that did not belong to her? She drug it to the trash and deleted it. 
So she deleted the file server. How could she do this? Because she was logged on as administrator. This is why when we start looking at least privilege, we want to make sure people don't do these things. So she drags it to the trash, and then I have to end up rebuilding their server. The company I was working for charged $165 an hour for me to go out there, minimum three hours. So it took about that long to find out what happened and to rebuild it. Two days later, what happens? Did it again. Over the next seven weeks, I was out there five times having to rebuild it. Finally, on the fifth time out there, Renee looks at me after I get done rebuilding it, and she says, what do you think she says? <laughs> How do you quit on your husband? She says, maybe we should change the way that we log on so that no one's, not everyone's an administrator. I said, you should only be an administrator when you're doing what? Administrative tasks. After that, you should be coming in as an end user. The only time you should be an administrator is when you're doing administrative tasks. So they changed their bylaws to say that any time Renee needed to come in as administrator, somebody else would be sitting with her. So that way, everybody's not logged in as an administrator. We also have something called the need to know. You know, I get the opportunity, greatest opportunity in my life, to travel around the world and go to all these great bases and meet the best men and women in the world and work with them. And I was up out at Offutt Air Base. Where's Offutt Air Base? Nebraska. Nebraska. Omaha or as I call it in the Hawaiian, Omaha. So the very center of the United States, so I had to give it a Hawaiian name. So Omaha, I'm in Omaha, and I'm at this location, and they decide to have me teaching in a skiff. What? I'm teaching a CISSB class in a skiff. For me to open the skiff, I gotta go find two people to come in and open the skiff. One's gonna use their swipe card, the other one's gonna have this little lock that they're opening up. Why do I need to be in a skiff? And what I loved about it is, you know, years ago I had to get a clearance to get on some of the bases. So I've got a secret clearance. And I walked in the room and I went, finally, finally, I'm in a room where the machines are finally marked at a level where I can actually get on them. And they looked at me and they went, but you have no need to know. And that's always been my problem. I have the access, but I have no need to know anything. So it's really funny when I'm on base, they always tell me with your laptop, don't plug it in. Why don't I want to plug my system into your network? What's going to happen if I do that? What's going to happen when I do that? If I plug my system, your, la your cable, into my computer up here, how quickly is somebody going to be standing at that door? Looking at me and without the glove going, Eric, would you please come? <laughs> I've only had to do that once on one base. And that was the last, and I looked at it and I went, you didn't tell me I wasn't supposed to, I was looking for internet access. And he went, no. Could you give me those rules up front maybe? That would be nice. So that need to know, you should only have access to those things to do your job and that need to know. The separation of duties. So let's say that you go ahead and hire me. So Bill, you hire me to be a contractor, to come in and teach a class for you guys. Um, and you're paying me $150 an hour. Thank you very much for that. But I noticed on the paycheck that you gave me, it was $450 an hour. Why would you be paying me more money? And this, I'm just making this up. Bill and I have never met before. We're just making this up. Why would you be paying me more money than what we agreed upon? What, were you ex what are you expecting in a little brown paper envelope there at the end of the whole class? A little kickback, maybe? So this is why we have that separation of duties is because we want to make sure the person that's signing the contract is not the person who's paying that contract. When I teach out in Guam, I teach for the New Horizons out there and Sabeti, who's the owner of the New Horizons, always pays me on Friday. So in their separation of duties, they want to make sure that Sabeti signs it and his wife, Suk, also signs the check. So I go in on Friday to pick up my paycheck, and somebody's sitting there, and he's cutting a check for me, and he signs his name, and then he does this three times, and then signs his wife's name. And I'm like, uh, where's the separation of duties in here if you're signing both names? And he goes, well, I sign her name, and she signs my name. Is that legitimate? I said, let me call Suk and ask her if this is okay. He's like, fine. So I called up Suk, and she's like, yeah. He signs my name better than I do. And I sign his name better than he does. I said, so you guys do this? She goes, yeah. Well, then why do you have two signatures there? 
Eh, because our, our attorney told us it was the best thing to do. Really? So you think about that separation of duties, you want to make sure that one person doesn't have access to everything. Some of the access controls that we put on could be your access into the building, your access into the room, your access into the computer system. So we want to make sure that we are requiring that you are an authorized user to get into this. We think about the encryption. We want to make sure that data is unreadable should somebody steal our information. When we think about our cell phones, if you lose your cell phone, do you want it encrypted so that someone who finds your cell phone can't read it? Are the Apple iPhones automatically encrypted? They are. Are your Android phones automatically encrypted? No, they are not. So if you've got an Android, you want to go in and add some encryption to your system. Steganography, the ability to hide information inside of photographs, inside of audio, inside of video files. When I first started teaching the ethical hacking class in version 3, we had three stego tools that were out there. We now have over 30,000 steganographic tools. So the ability to turn around and hide information inside of a photograph, inside of an audio file, inside of a video file is very easy to do. And there are plenty of tools out there to do this. We talked about the integrity and some of the different tools that we have. We have what is known as a hashing algorithm. It's a digital fingerprint that is used to detect a specific file or an alteration to your file. Digital signatures would be one of the other integrity controls that we can use, provides for us hashing and encryption. We'll see those coming up a little bit later on. We think about our backups, the spare copies of data that's kept in a safe storage. Real close to here, if you go down to Highway 32 and you start heading past Washington Baltimore Parkway and you get up to Dorset's Run, I think it's called. Right up there, there's a company called Iron Mountain. What does Iron Mountain do? They shred. They shred your documents. What else do they do? They store your tape backups. So if you are utilizing them, they're going to give you one of those little ammo boxes from World War II, big square ones, where the top comes up. You put your tapes in there. You close it. You put your lock on it. And they've got a little number on the outside of that. So they scan that thing when it comes to their truck. And then that way you can, and they'll send you a message that says, here's the scanned number on that. So you come back and you say, I need the tape backups from two weeks ago on this date. So they'll go find that box and they'll bring it right to you. So you can get, go ahead and get that. About 12 years ago when I was teaching up here in Baltimore, in the USA Today, in the lower half of the newspaper, below the fold they call it, there was an article about a Iron Mountain truck that had been commandeered. When they found the driver and the driver's aid, they were duct taped to a tree. The back of the truck had been opened up, the lock was picked and, or actually cut, and all the tapes were gone. They never found who stole the tapes, they didn't know why they stole the tapes, but everything was gone. If you think about that situation, if somebody steals your tape, your tape backup, and gets your hands on it, how do you prevent them from being able to read it? You encrypt your tape backups. So here's the problem. You go and pull that encrypted file from four weeks ago when you had a different network administrator. Could it be possible that they have a different password that they use to encrypt the file? Could be. So this is why you always want to make sure that you've got a good list of the most current passwords that you have for that. So in the ethical hacking class, one of the tools that we give you is something called the Google Hacking Tools. And these help you find things on the Google website. <clears throat> One of my students in class is sitting there and she says, <clears throat> I want to look up something just out of curiosity. She puts in her company name and she types in default passwords. Within three seconds, this document pops up on her screen. She opens it and she goes, oh my God. I said, what is it? She said, two days ago, we got new passwords given to us. These are the new passwords. How did they end up on the internet so quickly? Somebody from her office put them up there. So she's on the phone. She excuses herself, goes outside, gets on the phone, calls her boss up, 
And she comes back and she goes, okay, all passwords have now been changed and only certain people are gonna get this file. It's no longer gonna be sent to everybody in the company because apparently somebody wanted to put it up on the online so that they would have access to it. There's a big oops right there because sometimes people will do that. So when we think about those backups, we think about where is it stored, who's got access to it, who can see this information. Version control becomes real important. I know you guys being in the military don't always have to update your resume, but I'm always updating mine every time I take a new test, a new exam, update. Anytime the exams come out, I have to take them. It's not one of those, oh, I'm already certified in it. No, I have to take. The companies I teach for, Phoenix TS included, require that all of us maintain our level of certification for every class that we te teach. So every time I update my resume, which is part of my bio, I just go back into it. And at the end of it, it's just got the new date of the last update that I have. So version control becomes real important to us. On the availability side, redundancy, making sure that we've got multiple or backup systems designed for immediate or quick recovery. Anytime you start thinking about our connections out to the internet, whether that be a router, whether that be a firewall, whatever we have, should that device go down and not give us availability or access to the internet, it's always good to have a spare or a hot, what we call the hot swappable that's already up there and running. So that if the primary goes down, the secondary takes over. So redundancy becomes real important to us. Fault tolerance, systems that continue functioning after a component failure. If I've got a power supply that goes down, I want to keep the drive, I want to keep that system up and running. If you're running something such as a RAID unit, RAID 5, if a drive goes down, I can pop it out, put the new drive in, rebuild this on the fly, and we can keep going. So we're going to take a look at some of the fault tolerance systems that we have out there. Patch management becomes important because we want to make sure that all of our systems are up to date. Remember, the moment that our system is not up to date, somebody's going to figure out that it's not up to date, and they are going to find that back door into our system. Again, they can simply use some of the tools that are out there that we've got, and we can, they can go ahead and, and find out if our system is active, and then they can run something like Netcraft against our system and find out what our latest operating system and our patches are. And then from there, they can go ahead and breach our system. So patch management becomes real important. Do we want to test the patches before we implement them? Is there any moment in time when a patch might disrupt some of the other applications that we have? So you always want to test this. You want to have a test bank or a test bed area where you can put this in. It's running all your current applications because if you bring this new operating system up or this new patch up, it may disrupt some of those other applications you have running. So you always want to test that first to make sure it's all going to work. Defense in depth is always important to us. Everything from the time that we walk into the physical location of the building itself. So we think about the gates, the guards, the guns. When we think about coming into the facility at night, we want to make sure that we've got the proper lighting. So your fence should be eight feet tall. Your lighting should be at least eight feet off the ground, should provide two foot candles of luminosity. What is luminosity? It is the measure of brightness. So two foot candles of luminosity is going to tell you whether or not your lights are bright enough. If you think about that security guard that you have the sitting in their shack out in front. Do you want the lights on the security guard or do you want the lights on the building away from the security guard? Why? What's that? So the security guard can see it. Anybody here ever been pulled over at night by an officer of the law? I'm not going to ask why. I've been pulled over too. What's the first thing they do when they get up to your window? Shine a light where? Where at me? In your eyes. Towards your face. Right there. Why? Right between my eyes. What's it going to do to my eyes? Dilation. It's, well, they're looking for dilation. dilation. They, you don't want dilation. Christopher, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I see you. I'm going to hit one of you. I don't know which one to hit. Yeah, he, I got you. you don't want the dilation. Right. They're putting the light in, their eye, in your eyes for two reasons. One, they want to see if it's dilated. They want to see if it's constricting down. They want to see the constriction. If they don't see it, 
Well, maybe, maybe they want to arrest you. But if your eyes are dilated, what's that mean? You've been partying without me, and you didn't invite me to the party, so yeah, you should be arrested. So the concern is you might be under the influence of drugs or alcohol, but you might also just be taking allergy medication, which does the exact same thing. The other part of this is they put their light in your eyes because that's going to momentarily blind you for about 30 seconds. Because if you have a gun hidden behind where they can't see it, you pull the gun out to go to shoot them, you don't know where the officer is because you can't see for about 30 seconds. So when we think about the lights, the lights should be not on the guard shed, but on the building itself. So the guard can actually then see the building. So we start thinking about the building itself. When you get up to the building, we think about the locks that we have there. So I was out in Germany, out in Stuttgart, doing a, a class, and I had my car keys. I just wanted them out of my pocket, so I threw them on the table like this. And one of my students looks over, and she sees this key right here, which is my house key. And she looks at the house key, and she goes, oh, you got a quick set lock at home. And I went, you either are a third story person, or maybe you're a locksmith. She goes, can I borrow your whiteboard for a moment? I said, sure. She walks over and draws a picture of my key. And she says, move it back and forth. And I went, look at this. You've got every valley and every peak correct. She goes, there are 10 valleys and peaks in there. We just number them from 0 to 10. And I just look at your key, and I can tell what the number is. I can look at your key. You don't even have to take it off the ring. I can go make you a key. I said, how long is it going to take you to break into my house? She said, 30 seconds. I said, 30 seconds to take out your picks and go ahead and do that? She goes, oh, hell no, I wouldn't do that. Why would I waste my time doing that? I'm going to take out a drill and just drill right through it. I said, see, this is where I got you. I don't have one lock. I got a deadbolt in there, too. And she goes, okay, it'll take me 60 seconds. Because I'll go, Brrr, and then I'll go, because they're key to like, right? And I went, yeah. She said, you don't want a quick set. What you want is a slag. I said, why the slag? She says, because when I start drilling it, it's going to drop ball bearings into the shaft as it's turning. And what's that going to do to the shaft as it's turning? It's going to stop it in its place, and then the drill spins in the opposite direction, breaking the arm or the wrist of the person who's trying to break into my house. Then you just simply call the cops and say, check the local hospitals for someone with a broken wrist. And then you can find out who's trying to break in your house. And I said, okay, that's good to know. So have I changed my locks yet? No. Maybe. <laughs> so you start thinking about that side of it. You think about the locks that you have. You think about the way that we get in. Most cases, you're going to have a, a, your cack will get swiped. You put in your pin. It opens up the door and lets you in. Usually when you come into the front, as we have here, you have a receptionist who's sitting there or a security guard. Security guard looks at me and says, oh, you're new here. You don't have a badge, so we're going to have you sign in. They take my driver's license. When do they give me back my license? After they've replicated a few times and sold it on the Internet. No, I'm just kidding. They would never do that. Um, they actually give me the badge, which I have to turn in at the end of the day to get my driver's license back so that I can get back on the base later on. Yeah, you got those little quirky little things that you do here. So once I come into the building, I have to think about getting into the room I'm getting into to do my work and also into the machines. So we start looking at all those aspects of what we're doing. So we look at the physical security, the perimeter network, the internal network, the hosts themselves, the applications. So we only want to grant you access to those applications necessary to do your job. We only want to grant you access to the data and the applications to do your job. So we want to limit what you have access to. So as we look at defense in depth, we just keep getting further and further into this. If I happen to have an intrusion detection system, part of the intrusion detection system is taking a look at what are the responses that I might get. A true positive says that a problem occurred and was detected. A true negative says there's no problem, there's no alert. A false positive. I might be trying to gain access into my computer system, and I've got the, the cap locks on. I'm not paying attention. How many attempts do I get to log on before it kicks me out completely? Three. Is this really an event or an incident? No, it's considered a false positive because I was not paying attention to what I was doing. I was supposed to get in. but. The help desk is going to have to reset my password and say, okay, go ahead and try to get in. The one thing we do not want is the false negative. The false negative says, 
that the real problem went undetected. The person was able to get into our network and we did not know how they got into our network. That's the toughest one for us is when they get into the base, when they get into the building, when they get into our network, we have no idea how they got in or when they got in. So that's always the tough one for us. Okay, we got a couple of questions and we'll take a short break. Your first question, someone puts malware on your computer that records all of your keystrokes. What aspect of security was primarily attacked? Try again. Confidentiality, yes. So a keylogger com compromises your confidentiality by transmitting user input to the attacker. What type of control would a security assessment procedure be? That is operational, yes. Malware is a common example of a threat vector. True or false? Yes, it is. So the vector means the means by which an attack is made, in this case, the threat itself would be the damage that the malware is going to do. Which controls primarily protect data integrity? So hashing, yes. Is it backups or encryption? It's going to be backups. Because they're looking at the primary integrity controls, encryption would be a secondary integrity control. A security program alerts you of a failed login attempt to a secure system on investigation. You learn the system's normal user accidentally had the cap locks turned on. What kind of alert was this? That is a false positive. Okay, let's go ahead and take a short break. We'll get started about five minutes to 10 o'clock. So about 12 minutes. Is that plenty of time? Yep. Okay. All right, that's a 9.55 Eastern Standard Time.